Thanks, Paddy. Um, and thank you, Frank, for uh, having me here. Um, I was slightly worried about what Paddy might say about me because I went to, to college with him. Uh, so I'm glad he gave all the positives there. <laughs> it's only because he got there in second. Yeah. He could have told other things about me, but anyway. Um, the other thing is I feel very humbled to be uh, amongst uh, achievers like uh, those to my uh, left. So uh, instead of representing a small startup here, I'm going to represent a small startup in UCD. So I'm going to borrow UCD to make me feel a bit bigger than I otherwise am. So, uh, um, the okay, so uh, yeah, Paddy is right. Um, I spent a number of years in the medical device industry, uh, having qualified here as a mechanical engineer in 1986. Uh, I got very fed up with manufacturing, went back to college, uh, got a master's in biomedical engineering and uh, decided I needed to do something in research and development uh, that would uh, bring things a little bit uh, further along in the field that I enjoyed working in. So uh, I started in bio. Um, we struggled for a long time until we actually came up here to Dublin. Um, and as Paddy said earlier, we completely changed how we operate. Uh, in other words, we pivoted. Um, so we started off with a sort of a blaze of glory. We won the All-Island All Seed Corn competition in 2006. Then we nearly collapsed uh, through infighting. We did it again in 2009-10. Um, and uh, I'm still here. So. Um, major part of still being here was moving myself, because that's all that was left of the company in 2011 up here to UCD. Um, I parked the medical side of the business because uh, I thought that the hurdles were too high, so I decided to opt for space instead. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, uh, but it's worked out. Um, so um, we really have benefited from being here. So. I'd like to, I suppose, emphasize the fact that we're a spin-in company. And small companies need this environment in which to uh, thrive. Uh, so that's why I started off talking about the partnership that Inbio has with UCD. It's vital, it's important, and hopefully over the course of uh, my few words, I'll be able to emphasize that further. So effectively what we have is a very simple technology. I think it would appeal to Martin in terms of what he talked about um, because we have a new way of working with metals that's both environmentally friendly, very powerful, but also um, very, very uh, energy clean. So I'd like to think we have the type of technology that I could put into Palo Alto and not upset Patrick. So, uh, effectively what we do is we take off the oxide layer of those type of metals that are uh, typically used in the body, uh, titanium, uh, stainless steel, cobalt, chrome, those that are used to make uh, hips and knees, nitinol for stents. Um, and what we do is we grip blast. So we use a technology that's used to typically ablate a surface off of a metal and we use it to actually deposit another material down. So uh, I have a little video here, but uh, the, the, um, it's called co-blast because effectively we mix two different media together. One is a grit, the typical thing that you use are sand. The other one is the material that you're trying to get on the surface. Uh, you might wonder, well, how does one material go down when you, take, uh, when you uh, knock off the oxide layer? The metal underneath informing the oxide layer in the first place. It's very reactive. So it wants to passivate itself. So if we provide another material in that tiny little window of time when the metal is denuded, it'll react with that material and passivate itself with that material. So I have a little video here. Hopefully it, uh, it actually uh, it works for us. So here's a, a bone screw, a uh, titanium bone screw, and uh, you're, you're watching a grit blasting process. You see a lot of sparking as the oxide layer is knocked off. 
But what's also in that stream of material is a, a hydroxyapatite. It's the calcium phosphate, a synthetic version of a calcium phosphate that's in your bones and in your teeth. So when you look at the, at the two little photographs uh, underneath the video, on the left-hand side, you, you see a shiny anodized, an, a lovely shiny oxide layer on, on the titanium metal. On the one on the, on the right, you see a sort of a matte finish, but that's actually covered with, with synthetic bone, very, very thin. Oh, sorry, I'm after uh, hitting the wrong key. This is what we do now. Um, We've won the contract to coat the heat shield on the solar orbiter. And lo and behold, what are we putting on the titanium foil that forms the front of it? We're putting down bone. Um, so we're using what we learned out of the medical device sector to protect this $3 billion project, 3 billion euro project, uh, from burning up four-fifths of the way to the sun. It launches in 2017, it reaches uh, its destination in 2020, and it orbits the sun for a number of years looking at solar storms and trying to understand how the solar storms affect our weather patterns, how to protect satellites from burning up, how to stop uh, our uh, electrical grids from going down, etc. over the uh, years into the future. Um, how did this happen? One of the guys that I was working with while we were still in Cork made an application to the European Space Agency. They were desperate for new technology. Um, we put down bone that wasn't white, it's black. So the surface of the heat shield is black, it soaks in all of the different frequencies, converts them to uh, infrared energy and dispels them to, to deep space at the edges of the heat shield, which, is, which you can see there in the picture facing the sun. Um, we did this in about a year. Uh, that's a record for the European Space Agency. I think the next uh, quickest adoption of a concept to flight hardware is six years. So um, they were very interested in us all of a sudden. Um, so they asked us to do other things as well. But this is a, a, a sort of a, a scientific look at what we do. You can see on the left-hand side there's a black material on a cross-section of titanium. Uh, in the middle you can see the silver look of the titanium before it has been blackened where the arrow points down to it. And on the right hand side you see an aluminium tube that has been blackened on the inside with the same technology. These are other components. Um, the European Space Agency came back to us. Uh, we felt uh, very liked and uh, uh, encouraged, if you like, as a company. And all the while, I was growing uh, from uh, very few people that I had taken on when, we went to, when I came into UCD first. We're taking on more and more people with that sort of a gentle helping hand that we were getting from the agency. They asked us, could we put down a white coating? And if we went back to look at the actual picture of the orbiter, the uh, antenna that's hanging down underneath that's the high gain antenna, that's transmitting all of the data back from the different instrumentation on the craft. They wanted the white coating on that, but we, don't, we can't do a white coating. If you put white powder down on a metal, it looks grey, as you saw on the screw. It didn't turn out white, even though we were putting a white powder down. So uh, we resisted for a while, um, they persisted, and eventually we went uh, to the materials and uh, uh, mechanical engineering department and ask for some help. And that proved to be very fortuitous because what we have down here uh, in the bottom image uh, on the, is, a, is a white ceramic material on top of uh, a titanium substrate. The piece that's in the middle, if you look at it, there's a sort of a, a little fringe there. That's the black bone. Why is the black bone underneath the white surface? Well, if you take titanium or aluminium or any of these metals with an oxide layer on them, the oxide is inert. It's very hard to glue anything to it. But when you put bone down, the bone is very chemically active, and you can now stick things to those metals. So we're using a byproduct of the animal industry, the meat industry, 
Um, we're using the same material that was used to paint images on the walls of those caves in France in prehistoric times. It's the same material used to refine your sugar. It's used as a fertilizer. It's as green as you can get. So we're transforming how these very difficult to work with metals, uh, they're very common now, aluminium. You, you, you use it every day if you drink Coke or Pepsi or whatever. Um, titanium is becoming ever more popular in sports products. So you touch these things all the time. In actual fact, you don't touch them. You touch the oxide on them, right? But they're really difficult to work with. You can't. You've never seen a painted aluminium bike. You've never seen a painted a, a titanium bicycle frame. It's very hard to get anything to adhere. We've changed that with bone. And there are other materials we can use. So um, from a, a, an environmental or an ecological point of view, we're, we're, we're using a, a material that is often just uh, dumped and thrown away. We can put down Teflon using the same technology, just from a powder. We don't need any high temperatures or dirty chemistries. We, we just put it down, and you can see up on the right-hand image, we can get uh, super hydrophobic surfaces on these metals that would rival anything else that's, down, uh, that's out there. We're putting down zinc phosphate. Zinc phosphate is a material that's used in dental uh, cements. So in a, another innocuous type of material. But it's a very powerful, for all of you that might understand galvanizing or zinc plating or that type of thing, it's the material that's used in zinc plating. But if we put it down as a dry powder, you can actually stop metals corroding. So on these two uh, pieces of metal here, the one on the right-hand side had zinc phosphate put in the middle. There's rust on the two edges, but that's bl rust bleeding from the top. Um, the European Space Agency is extremely excited about this one because corrosion accounts for 5% of the gross national product globally per annum. Right? The cost of metal corrosion in the US alone is somewhere in the region of three billion, $300 billion per annum. So corrosion is a major, major issue for the modern world. This is uh, on site in UCD. Uh, it belongs to the European Space Agency. So we actually produce all of the components for the solar orbiter here in the campus. The European Space Agency you don't have to read this. Effectively, what it's saying is that the, the reason that they exist is obviously to do space exploration. But everything that they do in space has an impact in our everyday lives. And that's their, that's their uh, I suppose, uh, dream is to make sure that all the technologies used in space actually spread out into normal everyday life. Uh, and that's uh, as determined by their uh, director general there's a list of things here on this page where they talk about what they try to do. They only mention space twice in it, but really what they're trying to do is make Europe more competitive using technologies that are generated for space. Actually, to, to you know, and a lot of that is efficiency, as you will see with one of the slides that I have near the end. Um, they spend about 4 billion euros per annum, uh, and about 85% of that goes out to uh, industry, and we're thankfully a huge beneficiary of that in Ireland. So this is the slide I wanted to get to in terms of what uh, space means for us. As you can see, we have quite a simple technology using very simple materials to do quite uh, complex things. Um, they've just, in the last couple of years, launched a, a clean space initiative in the European Space Agency, and the guy that uh, gave us this quote, I know quite well at this stage, I spent uh, uh, quite a lot of last week with him. Uh, some of the materials, processes and coatings we work with are environmentally dirty and hazardous for health and safety. Uh, Martin put up a slide there showing about all, all the different efficiencies that have been attained over the last number of years in, in lots of different areas, but coating metals is a filthy process. Uh, there are sludges and, uh, you know, damaging byproducts of that sector. To put hydroxyapatite on a hip stem, 
using another technology, it's done at a minimum of 5,000 degrees Celsius, close to the temperature of the surface of the sun, and anything up to 12,000 degrees Celsius, the thermally plasma spray material onto the surface. Ours is done at room temperature. The byproduct from our process you can spread on land. So we fit right in to their objectives in terms of uh, clean space. But clean space for the European Space Agency is clean industry. So you can see the, there's three points underneath there. One of them is the green economy. They're totally and utterly dedicated to that. That's why they're courting us uh, in a major way to look at some of those technologies that I showed you in the previous slides. For example, the zinc phosphate or putting down Teflon without having to do uh, any of those dirty chemistries. Additive manufacturing. If you start off with a solid piece of metal to make a component, 70% of that metal either has to go back in to be recycled or it goes in the bin. And typically for the aerospace sector, a lot of it goes in the bin. Same with the medical device sector. A lot of the offcuts are actually dumped. With additive manufacturing, where you start off with a powder and you coalesce it, there's very little waste and there's very little energy usage either. The other thing that we're trying to promote is design for demise, so that you actually understand from the very onset how the product is going to be dealt with at the end of life. Just a few facts about us, and I think this is important for any of you that are from UCD as well, because it's been a shared effort. Um, I think we have about 20 employees, most of them doing some level of part-time work but we've taken on seven PhDs out of UCD. <clears throat> um, six of those were on their way abroad. So I don't believe this thing about the brain drain, by the way. I think that companies, companies need to come up and they need to sit themselves at a desk in a university, talk to the academics, involve the academics in their business, and start cherry picking people off that conveyor before they get on the plane in the first instance and work with those companies thereafter. Give them projects that are meaningful for their final year projects or for their masters or their PhDs and already have them somewhat trained for the job that they're going to take up in this country. Um, the facility I showed you a picture of it in Nova UCD, we have another one pending to do the white coatings. We have developed a super black coating um, that is close to black body, much better than the one that I showed you earlier in terms of soaking in light pollution so that you get much, much better images from far away clusters or stars or whatever it might be. So we have in introduced three products now into the European Space Agency at this stage. We're baseline, they reckon, for the next two decades at least. Uh, we're in the top three technologies that are currently studying in ESTEC in Holland. Uh, we've hosted three of their thermal uh, control workshops for the solar orbiter here in UCD. Um, we're now being uh, courted around the different companies that they all deal with, the subcontractors, etc. Um, thankfully, EI uh, are seeing us as being a company that will survive now rather than the one that nearly died two or three times. And um, we've been selected by UCD as part of their branding for innovation. Uh, and there's lots more happening uh, in terms of some of the other technologies. As I showed you, we're dealing with two of the biggest adhesive companies in the world at the moment. We're talking to a Formula One uh, uh, auto company, and it's just growing. And uh, so hopefully I'll be taking more PhDs out of uh, UCD in the coming years. So thank you very much. That's me.